Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Chats with Chaudhry. I'm delighted to be joined by Rina Decour, who is president and co-founder of BioTools. And today we're going to be talking about her journey in science in developing BioTools over the last 20 years as a business. And actually the challenge she faced as a woman in science, actually, because she's one of the few women at that time who were working in science and starting their own business. We're also going to be talking about chiral technology and drugs as well. So, Rina, how are you? I'm good. It's wonderful to see you, Rizman, especially in person. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely to see you too. In fact, the last time we saw each other in person was in March at PitCon, actually. So it seems a lifetime ago uh, being at PitCon and the live shows like that. It does. It does indeed. Yeah, well, different world we live in. It has been a different world. Look, now, Bytools is actually celebrating 20 years this year, which is a fantastic achievement. So congratulations. Thank For those you. people who don't know about Bytools, perhaps you could tell them a little bit about Bytools first and give them a bit of background on the business. So by two, thank you. Thank you, Reason, for asking. And indeed, it seems like, you know, the PitCon was actually the last time I traveled and it's the longest non-travel time for me in 20 years. So it's, uh, it does feel a little bit different and weird, but as many other people, we have uh, taken the time to, to feel and to understand what is important in both personal and work issues. So BioTools uh, was founded 20 years ago. It's, it's incredible to, to, that we're celebrating 20 years. And our motto is characterization experts, uh, chirality and biologics. So we do that with very disruptive for the lack of better word than the word that's being used too much, yeah. but disruptive technologies and services for pharmaceutical industry, academia and government labs. So that's what we do. We do um, very unique instrumentation and very niche services. Right. Okay. Now, as I said, it's 20 years uh, old now. So perhaps you can give me a background. I mean, you started out as a scientist. How did you come up with the idea of launching by tools in the first? So what's your background? Okay. So I have a PhD in physical chemistry from yeah. University of Illinois at Chicago. I studied under Professor Timothy Keiderling and we studied technology called vibrational circular dichroism. It's short, uh, VCD is a, is a short notation for it. And when I went to industry, I went to industry uh, to Amoco as a postdoc. And when I got there, um, there was no, no, sort of spectroscopic techniques we were doing proteins dna all kinds of um, biological molecules and i really wanted to buy vcd and coincidentally at about the same time chemical and engineering news were um, on the cover were doing stories almost annually on the development of chiral drugs right and so when I started reading those articles, I immediately realized that, wow, the technology I used in my PhD thesis or in my PhD study for biological molecules would be exceptional for the use of chiral drugs. <laughs> and so I immediately decided that I have to commercialize VCD. I contacted Professor Nafi, who was a competing group from us, Lawrence Nafi at Syracuse. And he also thought it would be phenomenal if we could commercialize VCD. So we decided to be partners and the rest is 20 year history. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was really, CNN really opened my eyes to small molecule pharmaceuticals because I did not know anything about that. I was really a biological person. Right. Well, as, so, as, as a woman in pharma though, I mean, obviously I know having worked in pharma now for the last four or five years, uh, you know, women in science has become a huge topic, you know, and inclusion and diversity within the workplace. Now, obviously being a woman 20 years ago in pharma, there was even fewer women in the commercial side, if you like, or commercialization uh, side of pharma. So how was it then in terms when you were starting up in terms of other women in, in the sector and, and what challenges did you face? So I'll start with my walking in as a PhD into Amoco Biotech. It was a biotech division of Amoco. I was the only other woman PhD as I started my postdoctoral, industrial postdoc. And honestly, I was shocked because in graduate school and graduate studies, we have a lot of women. Given that most women were in organic chemistry and biochemistry and not so many in physical chemistry, I was still quite surprised that I was really pretty much the only woman. The other woman left uh, shortly after I started. So for a few years, I was the only woman. We started hiring later on and 
brought some other women there, but for a while. And so when I started my business, I did not know any other women, either entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in spectroscopy or analytical sciences. I do know that there were two others now. I still only know one personally. I've met her twice, but I only, and I know another woman. And I will tell you, um, Razvin, the biggest challenge, I think, I, you know, I'm very outgoing person, as you know me. Um, and for a while, I didn't even realize I was the only woman. Right. But as we entered the meetings, I found myself not being able to speak the language sometimes. So for the icebreaker, so, you know, when people go, people heard me say this many times, when you start the meeting, there is donuts, bagels, coffee, and all the men are talking about the sports as an example, right. what team won the day before or the night before. Right. And so I made it my point to learn Whatever city I was in, whatever kind country I was in, I had to know so that I could be part of the conversation. And some women will, will tell me, well, you adapted to men. In a way I did because I wanted to be part of the conversation, but I also continued to wear colorful suits, you know, jewelry, makeup, and I was always a part of the conversation. I always made sure that I was the attention and that they need to listen to me. <laughs> Yeah. And so that really opened up my eyes and, um, you know, I'm very big, you know, one of my biggest passions is women in sciences and supporting young women and not just entrepreneurship, but really immigrant women, <laughs> because I was an immigrant myself. I was born in the old Soviet Union. And as I go to most of our conferences, like FACS and PITCON, American Chemical Society and biological, you know, a lot of meetings, there is a lot of immigrant women these days in sciences. And I find that they are less outspoken. They are afraid to become part of the circle. And I try my best to draw them in. And the other thing that really works is to educate the men because they all have wives, they all have daughters, nieces. So they want the women to be included, but they don't always know that it's an issue. They really don't. They just go about, especially scientists, they have one track mind. They know what they I need feel. to do. And opening up their eyes and pointing out to why women do not sit down and, you know, um, in, at the table, as, as, as it's being said, or why women don't speak up or why women don't um, bring the issues to the table is very important. Mm -hmm. Um, very, very important. We had a session last year at the SciEx meeting um, in, um, whatever it was, the SciEx meeting, seems like ages ago. Uh, <laughs> I just, I can't even remember where it was now. But anyway, um, we had a fantastic panel of women from recent graduate to a very advanced uh, director from Procter & Gamble, Diane Perry. Uh, but what really struck me is how many men came to our session and how many men uh, were able to answer the questions and listen in terms of the promoting women in pharmaceutical industry and dealing or not dealing with them, working with them as graduate students and postdocs. So it's an important conversation to have. And how do you think, I mean, from your perspective, what changes have you seen over the last 20 years or so in business in relation to women in science? I think definitely women have risen up to many, many management positions. I personally have seen a lot of the women that I've started working with 20 years ago uh, as young scientists have now become directors in pharmaceutical industry, they lead groups, they even VPs. I know several women who have risen up. Um, you know, there is several, many more CEOs now, not enough, but we will get there. Um, so I think the opportunities are there. I think from my perspective, what I see on the ground level, sometimes it's not even the men that don't let you get to the ceiling, sometimes the women are shy enough to step away. We do have more responsibilities at home. We really do, no matter what what is being said. Like I have really good friends and she has become a CEO of um, um, technology company and her husband helped with children. So when you have a very supporting spouse, a husband yeah. or a significant other, whoever it is, 
if you have that support, then you can rise. If you don't have a support, it's going to be extremely difficult. So I always tell women that I mentor that it's absolutely critical, not just to drive yourself and push yourself to be involved, to take the challenge and to step up yourself, but find the partner that will help you do that. Not it has to be equal partner. And I think that's where it starts. The partnership must be equal. You can't just be the one doing the cleaning, the children, the cooking and all of that. You have to have somebody who will take exactly the same equity in the household. So you can help you, you know, you can get to your career step and and do that. Right. And what about in terms of culture? I mean, you've had your own business as for 20 years. How have you developed the culture of that business? Oh, great question. So yes, it starts at home. (laughs) It starts uh, with me. And I prefer to hire women for the positions, um, for as many positions as I can. Scientific position, accounting positions, you know, support positions. I've had many women scientists, uh, managerial positions as well. Obviously, you know, I would hire a great man um, if they're you know, I don't discriminate based on science, but I try. Some people even accuse me for trying to go too much, too much to hire uh, women who need support, who haven't had a job before, or who need an internship. We bring a lot of interns. BioTools is known here in Florida as one of the top inter- internship locations, and we bring, you know, men and women. But I do, I do try to bring as many women as I can. Like I said, especially if they're from the immigrant families, so that they have an opportunity opportunity to see not just to be in science uh, and not just to see if they want to do science or business of science so to speak but to see examples of what women can achieve you know I I like to show that not just with myself I had you know several other many other women here who serve as great examples of that right okay and we started at home sure and um Looking back over the last 20 years, so if you look at uh, the business as a whole, you know, putting aside the fact about being women, what were the biggest challenges you think you face in sort of developing the business uh, overall? That's an excellent question. Um, so when I started the business, you know, I dived into it just as with the passion almost without knowledge. I had scientific knowledge. I now had Professor Nafi who knew a lot of obviously a lot about pcd experimental and theoretical issues we had a fantastic partner in a smaller company smaller small company uh known as bomam in quebec canada they're an ftir company it's now abb so they were a fantastic partner and i owe them tremendous amount of gratitude for helping us out but i did not know at the time at all i came out of phd science i had no idea that somebody could go and raise money to help with commercialization and marketing effort and bringing it to the market. To me, as an immigrant and doing everything and achieving everything on my own, I came to America when I was 15 and I literally worked three jobs almost from day one. When I went to undergraduate, I worked graduate school, I supplemented the income as much as I could. So I've always, always worked. And I could not imagine that you could ask somebody for money for your business. When somebody told me that, I just, I could not imagine that, (laughs) that somebody would give me money, me, the little Rena wanting to do VCD. How can somebody do that? Um, And I had a fantastic business plan that I presented to the president um, and president of Bowman, Gary Whale at the time. And he took a chance on me. And so uh, Gary Whale and Harry Byer, from Bowman, they took a chance on myself and Larry Nafi, but I did not know. And I think that was my biggest, you know, people say you do, you know, it's good and bad to take, to take investors. But I think if I at least would have known that that was a possibility, we would have gotten to market much faster. So that the challenge of how do you get a very sophisticated capital equipment instrument that costs over $150,000 
how do you get the parts? How do you do all of that? And so that was a challenge from the beginning. And I think our challenges as we grew, as we got to the market, as we expanded the product portfolio, the challenges obviously changed. And, and our biggest challenge right now, and we didn't realize that until I would say maybe five years ago, is that we pushed it to pharmaceutical industry, but it's a brand new technology. It's not making a better mousetrap. It's not making a smaller Raman instrument with all due respect to everybody who did. It was phenomenal. But Raman existed for 70 years before that, 75 years. Uh, it's not a different, it's not a better instrument. It's a completely brand new technology, completely a brand new way of looking at chiral molecules. So, and we were against the gold standard of x-ray crystallography. So how do you do that without funding and without support and without mentorship and without just capital? <laughs> how do you build that? So that was the original challenge. And what we've learned is that because we went directly to pharmaceutical industry, our first supporters were fantastic scientists in the pharmaceutical industry. What we learned is that students in graduate schools have never heard of it because it's not a technique that's being taught in either undergraduate or graduate level. Right. So young scientists are now coming 20 years later and they say, VCD what? It's a virtual, it's a video disc, what are you talking about? And you know, I've had one company here, they, they came to Biotools and they said, Rina, your biggest challenge is that this technique must be taught. And so we have, uh, we have a campaign called Teach VCD. We're trying to encourage as many academics as possible because VCD really teaches, you know, vibrational spectroscopy, quantum chemistry, chirality, and so on. So that's a challenge, but it's a little different challenge than the business challenge. It's really a scientific challenge. Love it. So what advice, one piece of advice would you give to anybody now starting up their own business within the science field? million dollar question um you know i watch now and listen to a lot of different podcasts um from a lot of very famous and known business uh people and the first podcast uh, the first advice everyone gives is just start just you have an idea just start and that is true but in science it's a little different you have to understand, deeply understand what other techniques you're competing with, unless you're making molecules. Like, so I separate from people who make fantastic medicines or, you know, making some kind of diagnostic kits or not diagnostic, but a molecule is different than a tool. Sure. And so if you're making a tool, you really have to understand what other tools are on the market. Yep. And it's, it's critical to do your due diligence on that. Absolutely critical because there are so many techniques on the market now. There are t a lot of tools and scientists solve problems all the time, right? Even people say, well, how did they do chirality or absolute configuration before you came along or before VCD? Yes, they did, you know, they did absolute configuration with crystallography. They had to grow crystal. So you have to understand why your technique or why your tool is better than the other tool. So doing your due diligence on science is absolutely critical because pharma especially is very difficult. It's very difficult for pharma to adapt new technology. Right. Yes, they all have innovation groups, but the reality of it is the scientists themselves, unless it's driven by a single scientist or a group of scientists, they're used, they know what they know, right? They've learned NMR, they've learned mass spec, they've learned chromatography, they've learned extra in graduate school, and that's what they're going to use. <laughs> Why would they want to use a brand new technique unless they were really a curious person? <laughs> Sure. So if you have a scientific curiosity, you can do that. So back to your question, I think the first thing you do is you do scientific due diligence. The second thing you do is if, you, if it's a tool, you have to figure out where your money is going to come from. Either it's going to be an SBIR, STTR grant, or if it's going to be an investor, uh, or if it's going to be friends and family, or if it's going to be a bigger company that notices you and says, okay, this technology might be useful for us. We will, you know, be a minor investor. Yeah. So that's important. That was one of our mistakes. I, you know, as I said before, I didn't appreciate that part of business. And um, I would strongly recommend. And the third and most important is you surround yourselves 
with the people you trust, people who understand and know the technology and know you and how you work, and people who would work hard and will be honest. I was, um, you know, early on, I got this award and I was flown to Washington, D.C. And I was sitting at the table with entrepreneurs and this woman told me, I'm going to give you one advice. And I said, what is, it? what is it? And she said, it's not who you hire, it's who you fire. That's going to be the most critical aspect of your business. And I thought she was like, it seemed like an odd advice to me at the time, but it is hard to fire. Like as a mother, as a woman, that was a challenge for me to be harsh and to yeah. say, okay, you no longer have this job. <laughs> yeah. And so you take time to hire the right people. <laughs> Sure, is, is the yeah, third yeah, advice. Yeah, well, that's good advice. So, so let's talk about chiral technology now. So, uh, my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about. So, w what changes have you seen in the last twenty years, and you know why is it still relevant? Okay, so chirality. Is, okay, that's a great question as well. So, I said twenty years ago, Chemical and Engineering News was publishing chiral drugs on every, you know, on once a year, and issue dedicated to that and they no longer do that but the reality of it is is more and more drugs as we started in pharma i would say back 20 years ago maybe 40 percent of new drugs were chiral so for those of you who don't know chirality means not superimposable mirror images and a typical drug that's best known is like lipitor or plavix a lot of you might have heard of a drug called thalidomide that <clears throat> Is a receive, it racemizes or changes to both forms in your body and it created issues for women back in the 60s. And that's how one of the reasons FDA started issuing guidance on, on drugs and especially chirality. So back then, uh, when we started, I would say 40 to 50% of all drugs, small molecule drugs were chiral. As, um, as we went along, I would say now would probably be about 80%. If you look at all small molecule drugs approved by FDA in 2018, I think it was 90 or 85% of all small molecule drugs were yeah. chiral. Also a lot of pesticides, herbicides are chiral. Uh, fragrances and flavors are chiral. Right. And a lot of people don't realize this, but in not pharmaceutical, but other industries of pharmaceutical, then we have um, environmental um, and also cannabis industry. Most cannabinoids are chiral. Right. And you see uh, people... Um, you know, getting sick, it's because but they're making synthetic um, cannabinoids potentially as uh, of, of the label and they might not be the right chirality or they might not be the, the right molecule completely. So, mm -hmm. and in this world, in the pandemic world, most antivirals are chiral. There's over 100 antiviral drug on the mar drugs on the market and over, hundred, over I, I would say there's like over 100 of them um, so Tamiflu is chiral, uh, Relenza is chiral because of the way they bind. Chirality has a shape and so the way they bind to their receptor is very important. So chirality is here to stay. <laughs> right, and so uh, what do you see the future for chiral technology then? How do you see it developing over the next few years? I think, you know, the chiral chromatography is a very well established field. I think there is a lot of, uh, every company does chiral chromatography to separate. Um, there's a lot of enzymatic reactions that are asymmetric. So they start with the, you know, they start with molecule and then they make a pure chiral molecule by the end of it. So all of that, I think, is fairly established. There are lots of groups around the world uh, working on catalysis and asymmetric reactions. I think for us in terms of VCD, I think it will only grow because the number of chiral molecules is growing. It, it's not like I, I just said, it's not just pharmaceutical. Our world is chiral. Everything we see, you know, if you think about four biological building blocks of life, amino acids, proteins, lipids, nucleic acid, and sugars, they're all chiral. 
So carbohydrate drugs and, and nucleic acid-based drugs um, also involve chirality. And so our technology, both for small molecules and for biologics, which maybe we can talk about next time or sure. someday, um, the biologics uh, also has chirality in it. And so that's all very important as well. I don't think our world, because our world is chiral, because we have all chiral molecules inside us, um, our receptors are chiral, I think chirality is not going anywhere. I think it's only going to grow and we start the tools for chiral uh, structure characterization, including VCD. Right. And so finally, because we talked about obviously your journey and chiral technology, but in terms of bio tools, what solutions do you offer which are unique then within this area? Okay, thank you for asking that. So we um, we are both an instrumentation company and a services company for right. those who cannot afford their own instruments. So our uh, featured instrument is known as a chiral IR. We have uh, so it's the instrument that we first incorporated or made back twenty years ago. It allows scientists to determine if you have the left or right-handed molecule. So it's still our, probably our best seller in terms of the instrumentation. Our goal is to get it to every single university in the world. That's, I think, the market. It's not just every pharmaceutical company and every environmental, you know, fragrances. But I think if we could get it for teaching into universities and colleges, that's my goal, that's my passion, that's what I want to see. Uh, we also offer an instrument for looking at biological molecules, which is a sister technique called Raman optical activity. So I know you 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 know Raman well, and so it's the same combination. It's an optical activity to the Raman, and it's fantastic for vaccine, you know, carbohydrates, vaccines, um, nucleic acid-based vaccines, or carbohydrate or protein base, and because we can measure proteins in DNAs. So it's a phenomenal technique. We've actually gotten R and D one hundred award for that. Um, we, we, I'd like to see it also in universities as much as possible and pharma. And then we offer services. So we do all of this for pharmaceutical industry and we do that for academics. I mean, we had uh, just a couple of recent cases where um, a professor or scientist would reach us and say, I submitted a paper and the reviewer came back and said, why don't you do VCD for absolute configuration? <laughs> So we love helping professors. We love helping students. You know, they, they spend four years synthesizing a molecule and then they don't know which one they synthesized and they, we don't want them to spend another four years crystallizing and trying to determine. So, um, you know, the services is a really big component for us, but the instruments is our, is our heart. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, um, I know that's what we've got time for, but that was really interesting. Thank you for taking time to talk about your history and the challenges you face. I think people will find that very interesting and useful. As you quite rightly mentioned, obviously we will have another, hopefully, conversation about the biologic side of the business and that technology, perhaps at a later Chats with Children. But uh, for now, if people want to know more information, where can they get more information about chiral technology? So uh, our website is biotools.us, um, biotools, one word, that .us. Um, we do have information on chirality or chiral technologies there. Obviously, you can Google more about uh, FDA has a guidance, um, USDA, EPA, um, European, they all have guidance on chirality, so you can learn more about that. And please feel free to link me in or email me at rkdecor at vitals.us. I'm always uh, thrilled to hear from customers and would be happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. All right, well, Rena, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate that. And so actually take the time out on Labor Day to have this interview. You could have been sending yourself on the beach on, in Miami rather than doing this. Well, there you go. So on South Beach. But uh, <laughs> thank you for taking the time out to do that. And uh, I hope everybody found that useful. As Rena quite rightly said, there is going to be a link above the video so you can go to the website and find out more. They've got lots of information on Cairo technology there. Uh, as Rina also said, if you've got any questions for her or, you know, whether it's about the technology or actually her experiences as a woman in science, I'm sure she'll be more than happy to, uh, to give you advice or, or give you her feedback on any things that you might want to talk about. Then by all means, get in touch with her directly or leave a comment below the video and I'm sure she'll be happy to answer that. So all that stuff we say, thank you very much, Rina, for your time. It was really lovely to see you again. 
Me too. And you stay well, my friend. Stay well, everybody. You Thank too. you for taking this opportunity. Love talking to you. Love talking to you as well. And uh, as always, to everybody else, uh, enjoy whatever you're doing today and for the rest of the week and for the rest of the year. And as always, stay well and stay safe. Thanks a lot.